Hello and thank you for joining me today. This video is in my Bach Tempo Practices playlist. And in this uh, video, we're going to investigate Bach's Prelude and Fugue in C major, the very famous one from book one. And what I want to do, as I did in the last video I made in this series, I want to hold up uh, two sheets here that you can screenshot and then print out and then you can follow along with me. That's the easiest way that I can do that. So before we do anything, I'm going to hold up this sheet, have you screenshot that, and then the second sheet, have you screenshot this. Good, that was quick and painless. Uh, the first sheet you might have already. So if you have that printed out from previous videos, that's fine. And then the second sheet is similar to the other one, but I've uh, modified it to fit this prelude and fugue. So you know by now from my previous videos in the series that Bach was a musical architect who apparently planned numbers of measures in his compositions. And I'm investigating here the preludes and fugues, but he did this in all his music is, is what I have found through my research. And in being the, the sort of musical scientist or musical architect that he was, Bach sought special duration ratios among movements, either pairs or sometimes groups of movements even. We haven't looked at those yet. And this prelude and fugue follows the 1-1 one, one duration ratio. I've all already mentioned this prelude and fugue in several of my other introductory videos on this topic and it's it's really very clear this is the, the probably the most clear example of a one one tempo ratio that really can't be argued with at all it, it really works perfectly too uh, from a musical standpoint so first what i want you to do first is look at the look at this uh, tempo matrix here and we've gone over these before that uh, i've explained about how these are the only <clears throat> numbers that can be found that can contribute to a, a perfect, a mathematically perfect matrix of numbers, which happen to be tempo and beats per minute. This is the, the best or most mathematically perfect matrix that can be found, that can be derived. Anybody can derive this. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have a PhD in mathematics. You don't have to use calculus. All you need to do is use a little mathematic skills, some basic arithmetic, and be a good musician and know about divisions of beats, and you can come up with this matrix. So then I suggest that Bach used a matrix like this is not going too far at all. He could have easily come up with these numbers. Of course, we <laughs> I don't have absolute proof in, unless we actually found a matrix of his somewhere, but we'll that will probably never happen. But my argument is that Bach knew his tempi and beats per minute, and he had a system. He had a hierarchical system, a, a tempo hierarchy that he used to plan his works, sort of standard default tempi belonging to each of these these tempo families here. So let's take the first prelude in C major and let's go to our logic sheet. This is what I call, this is what I call the logic sheet or the reasoning sheet. We can see that the pre, in Bach's C major prelude consists of 35 measures of 4-4, four, four, which comes to 140 beats 140 quarter note beats. There is actually an older edition. Uh, there's, if you, if you look at the C major prelude in some older books, it has an extra measure in there around the middle of the piece, which would give it 36 measures. So it's possible that Bach planned 36, who, who knows, 35 or 36, okay? But I'm going by 35 since that's uh, the, usually what the newer editions go by. The fugue consists of 27 measures of 4-4 four, four time, which makes 108 quarter note beats. 
So step one, if the quarter note in the prelude is faster than the quarter note of the fugue, this will result in a one-one duration ratio. Now our question becomes, well, how much, how much faster does the prelude need to be in order for this to happen? And we will, we will see this in a minute when we look at our tempo matrix and apply the tempi. So it says here, step two, determine reasonable tempi from the matrix. Okay, so let's do that now. So we're going to take this matrix. And the easiest way to apply this theory to box works is, is, is really none other than process of elimination. It's experimentation and process of elimination. So if Bach was a musical architect who planned duration ratios in his music, and if he knew his tempi in beats per minute, these would have had to have been the tempi, because this is really the only matrix of integers that can be derived that form a complete system. So if, I know there's lots of ifs, if this, if that, then this. But we're going by the assumption that if Bach planned his tempi, these are the tempi. Okay, so let's look at the prelude. Now the prelude is in 4-4 four, four time. The beat goes like that. Ta 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 And you have 16th notes. So in this case, we're going to look at the column with four quadruplets. I know that on the top, these are just eighth notes, but that's just generic. That could be 16th notes. So the tempo <clears throat> of the prelude is somewhere in this column. It's either 36, 42, 48, 54, 63, 72, 84, 96, 108. I'll just omit those really fast ones since they're obviously not correct. So if you just try some of these out, let, let's try some of these out. Let's try, let's try 42, just, just for fun. I'm going to put it, put the metronome on 42. Da, 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 da. Think of this objectively. Think of it objectively. I know you've heard this piece a million times. You've heard many recordings. You've heard many different tempi for it. But you have to really keep an open mind and think logically about what, what, is, what is the most reasonable tempo for it. Uh, and, and, you know, this the, the answer to that Will, come, we will be much more clear the more works of Bach's you study. So if you're not anything close to being a Bach scholar and don't really know much about his works, you're going to have a harder time than somebody who uh, perhaps, you know, is, is a mu music historian and or has lots of uh, knowledge about Bach's music in general. So, you know, it, it depends on who you are and how much experience you have with these styles. But let's just look at it objectively, listen to it objectively. Now, I just played 42, which if, okay, let's say if it were, was that speed, if Bach planned 42, he would have probably considered it around Largo, around maybe Largo or perhaps even Adagio. Okay, that's, that's a possibility, but it's, let, let's go to the next one. Let's now try it at 48. Let's see how it sounds at 48 now. This is the next step up from 42. Nice. 
nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That's a great tempo for piano students who aren't very advanced, who want to take a slower speed. 48. So that's probably around that Largo area as well, that Bach probably, if he planned it at 48, it would have been around Largo. Now let's try the next number up, 54. Let's try that. 54. This is what Bach would have considered, mm, you know, around the slower andante area. I like that even better. I like that the best so far. What about you? If you like, you can have your opinion. Think of if you try it out at 42, 48, and 54, which one of those do you think, objectively speaking, pretend like you've never heard the piece before in your life, you've never heard it before, and you this is the first time you've heard it, and you want to come to a decision. I think 54 is very nice. Nothing wrong at all with 54. So let's go, let's try 63. Try 63 and see how that sounds. From an objective point of view. You've never heard this before in your life. Like, uh, flowing water doesn't 63 54 is a little more sort of sedate sounding a little more um, pensive of sort of a not really sad but more of more of a very sort of deliberate kind of tempo 63 sounds a little more flowing 63 in my opinion sounds like I said like flowing water it gives it a, a it gives it a feeling of flow, but it's not too fast. Flow, but it's not too fast. Now let's try 72. See how 72 sounds. Remember, this is the first time you've ever heard the piece. You know, for many years, I actually thought it was 72, but I think I've, I've changed my opinion on this one. I like 63 better than 72. I like, and, and of course we could try 84. Let's just, for, for the fun of it, let's try 84 the next speed up. This would have been, if, let's say, if, it, if Bach planned 84 for this, this would have been what he would have considered Allegro sort of his default Allegro speed. Here's 84. Okay? I, I mean, it, I, I think it's too fast. <laughs> it just, it just is. And there's, there's no scientific proof it's too fast. It just, to me, it sounds too fast. What about you? Do you think it sounds too fast? I think it does. Okay, so process of elimination. Let's apply process of elimination to this prelude. And let's narrow it down to, say, two speeds. I think 84 is too fast. So we can, we can cross that off the possibilities. I think definitely 42 is too slow. In my opinion, 48 is too slow. I think, in my opinion, he, here's what I think. I think 54 or 63 are the optimal speeds for this. Either or. Either one. But we have to do further research to narrow that down. So let's, let's just right now, with that in mind, 
So we've, we've determined that, that we've narrowed it down to two possibilities, uh, 54, 63, perhaps 72. Let's, let's say three possibilities, either, either 54, 63, or 72. One, one of those three. Those are the best. Now, let's look at the fugue. Let's try out some possibilities for the fugue. Let's try, let's try the 42 for the fugue, which would have been like a very slow kind of largo, perhaps even on even adagio. That's a great speed for pianists who are just learning the work, who really need to slow it down. Let's try, just for the fun of it, let's try a little faster. Let's try the next one on the list, 48. This is also what Bach would have considered largo, but a little faster of a largo, perhaps even a slow kind of andante speed. 48. better than 42. It seems to have a flow. It has a flow. It's slow and it allows you to hear all the notes. It allows you to hear all the 16th notes, but it's not rushed. It's not too fast. Now, just for the fun of it, let's go to 54. Let's try that. So here are the fugue at 54. I used to really like that tempo. I, I used to think it was probably 54. Now I've sort of changed my mind. In my opinion, I don't know. I just think 54 sounds a little fast for me. Having studied all of Bach's works, I, I just think it's kind of fast. But just for the fun of it, let's go to 63. Let's try the next fast speed here. Here's the fugue at 63. That seems too fast. That seems rushed. And you know, one, one of the characteristics that really give it away are those 30 second notes. These, when you have, da da da. Whenever you, whenever you have 30 second notes in box pieces, it's a, I think, a good indication for a slightly slower speed so you can hear everything. Of course, those are the only 30 second notes, but they're ornamental 30 second notes and you have to allow time to hear them. So here's my opinion. I like, personally, I think 48 is the optimal speed for the few. If I were to narrow it down, if I were to narrow it down from an objective point of view, if I had to choose one tempo from, from all those tempi in, the, in column four here, I would choose 48 from an objective point of view. Now, like I said, uh, a few years ago, 20 years ago, even less than 20 years ago, I would have chosen 54, but I think I changed my mind. Okay, it's, a, it's okay to change your mind on things, but right now, having matured a little as a musician over the years, I think 48 is the optimal speed for the fugue. I think it, it, it's a perfect speed, I think, for it. Now, let's go back. Let's say if, if I'm going to choose 48 for the fugue, then what tempo 
from the of the prelude would have to be in order for these to be equal durations. So we, we have our reasoning sheet here, or our logic sheet, determine reasonable tempi from the matrix. So we have a few options for the prelude. The prelude sounds okay at 54, it sounds okay at 63, and it sounds okay, I guess, at 72, although that's a little fast in my opinion. The fugue, I think, I think I've narrowed down the fugue to where it's really best at 48. So let's say if you choose 48 for the fugue, then if you do the math, you can figure out that 63 is the optimal speed for the prelude. So here's step three. If you play the prelude at 63 beats per minute quarter note, and the fugue quarter note is 48, this results in the absolute or mathematically correct durations of 213 and 215. They're just two seconds off. Actually, Bach became, Bach was the closest he could have possibly gotten to that relationship because had he used 36, if we assume the prelude has 36 measures, it would have had, uh, it would have come to like 217 or 218. Actually, no, it would have been about the same in the other direction. So regardless of whether you take 35 or 36 measures, your his the resulting duration for the prelude at either one of those 35 or 36 measures is virtually the same with only a difference of two seconds of the, the fugue, which lasts 215 if played at 48. So now I'm not saying that Bach played these pieces and had a stopwatch and he timed it at 215. That's not what he was doing. He probably didn't know necessarily that the fugue was going to last 215, but, or it's 2.25, I guess. He, he, he could have known that. But the, the, uh, the thing that he did know was that, that they're, they're equal in duration. So he chose he planned the number of measures based on the tempi. So the ratio of measures equals the ratio of tempi at 4, 3. So the ratio of 63 to 48 is very close to 4, 3. Actually, 64 to 48 is 4, 3, but that's not on the matrix. 64 is only a triplet tempo. So 63 to 48 is is very close, it's virtually a 4-3 ratio, and the ratio of measures 35 to 27 or 36 to 27 are both 4-3 ratios. 35 to 27 is virtual, 36 to 27 is exact. So in other words, the fugue is one quarter slower and has one quarter fewer measures to account uh, so that the, the piece with the fewer measures is slower to account for the fewer measures, and the result is equal durations. So step four, this suggests Bach was aiming for 35 or perhaps 36 measures in the prelude and 27 measures in the fugue to achieve equal durations, which happened to be, in this case, 215. Although he wasn't so concerned always about exactly the seconds, like 215 necessarily, but he was concerned about making them equal, whatever that duration is. So it's really fascinating that uh, this prelude and fugue is an obvious one-one duration ratio. If you look up the, uh, there's an article from 1992 called it's by a scholar by the name of Don O. Franklin, and the article is called uh, The Fermata as Notational Convention in the Works of J.S. Bach. Uh, I used to have it printed out, but I don't know where it is anymore. Anyway, uh, Professor Franklin comes to this conclusion in that article also. He mentions this prelude and fugue and other uh, works from the Well Tempered Clavier, and that he, he, thinks the same as I do, that Bach was wanted to achieve some sort of duration ratios. Now, I didn't get this idea from Professor Franklin. Actually, I came up with it around the same time. 
my Bach theory was born in 1992, and Franklin's article was written in 1992, or published in 92. I didn't know anything about his article when I came up with my theory, so that happens to be a coincidence. But, but the fact that two scholars, me being one and Professor Franklin being the other, came to the sort of same conclusion really says something. So I'm not the only one, I'm not the only scholar in this world who has suggested that at least the C major prelude and fugue have the same durations. Although I am going so far as to say that all of Bach, Bach did that in all of his works. Either one, one, two, three, or one, two duration ratios. So what I want to do now is I'm going to play this. Let me uh, get my stopwatch here. And I'm going to play the 63, and I'm going to play the first prelude through and see how close I can get to 213. Stopwatch. My goal was 213 to 215. I got right there in the middle, 214. That's, that I think is, that is the tempo I think Bach wanted for this prelude. It's about an andante, a nice flowing andante speed, which sounds like flowing water. Now let's go down to 48, to Bach's sort of default kind of largo tempo. And I am going to play the fugue through, see how close I can get to 215.
All right, 212, 212. This view is a little rusty. I haven't played it in a long time, so excuse the little mistakes in it. But 212, so I was only three seconds off from my goal. So that shows you that it's very attainable. It's not, you know, you don't have to play like a robot. You don't, it's very, you know, you don't have to sound like a metronome when you play these. But simply, if you choose 63 for the prelude, if you choose 48 for the fugue, they last the same amount of time. Now, we could have said that also for uh, if you speed the prelude up a little bit to 72, then that would make the speed of the fugue 54. Or if you slowed them down, if you slowed down the prelude to 54, then the tempo of the fugue would have to be 42. Either of those pairs, either of those, those two or the one I played for you here, all of those result in virtually equal durations with only a difference of like two seconds. So uh, there, there is room for, there is room for experimentation here. You know, if, let's say, if I found out uh, someday, let's say I found out a week from now that there was proof that Bach wanted his prelude at 72, then that would probably be also proof that he wanted the fugue at 54. So there's a relationship between those two. If you choose something for the prelude, you choose choose tempo X for the prelude, tempo Y has to be the fugue, and they all come from this matrix here. So there we have our 1-1 one, one duration ratio in the prelude and fugue in C major. Thank you for joining me. Stay tuned for more videos like this in this series.